Okay, Irene, thanks very much uh, for, for the nice introduction. Uh, so, uh, just as yesterday, this is an online talk, so please interrupt me at any point with questions, comment, whatever you like, it's very important. So, today, near the end of the talk, yesterday, near the end of the talk, there were a few questions related to the question of what is a, a domain wall and what is a top down definition of what is coverdism, of what is the, the, the quantum gravity coverdism that I was talking about, right? So, I give you a procedure to compute it, okay? But, but some, some questions, like, fine, fine, that, that's the way you compute something, but how do you define this something independently? So I thought we'd start the lecture today with a very brief uh, um, recap of what is, because this is, I think, an object that I should have introduced just and I didn't, what is a domain wall in, in, um, in, in, a, in a theory of gravity, okay? Um, so let's start. Okay, suppose that you are trying to find out what are the possible quantum theories of gravity. You start you know, discovering string theories and you find out there's several different theories. For instance, there's many more, but for instance, suppose you're looking at gravity in 10 dimensions and then you, you have type to a string theory and type to B string theory. There's more, but let's just focus on this two. These theories are certainly different. They have different massless fields. So for instance, they, they share some fields, they have this geometric, they share some uh, gravitini, they share some two form B field to which the string couples to. But for instance, the spectrum of Ramon Ramon fields is different. For type one, you have these guys. And for type two B, sorry, for type two A, you have these guys. And for type two B, you have some other different guys. So these two are very different theories, okay? So, you know, it could be, and in fact, this is what people thought for a while, that this is just, you know, two different independent string theories. However, there is uh, a relationship on in the 80s, which is called T-duality, which relates the two theories. So people found out that if you take type 2A string theory and you put it on a circle of radius R, so now, you're, now we're talking about nine dimensional theories of gravity because we're compactified in a circle. This is the same as type 2B theory on a circle of radius alpha prime over R, where alpha prime is a, is a scale with units of length squared that appears in the theory, which is called the string scale, okay? So this thing is called, this one is called T-duality. And this is really a physical thing. What this means is you start with a compactification of type 2A on a circle of radius R and you make the circle very, very small, so that it has a, a size of, let's say, alpha prime over R. By the time you get here, the description in terms of type 2A variables is very bad. But there is a dual description in terms of type 2B string theory on um, a circle of radius uh, R. Okay? So it's a very, very physical equivalence between theories, right? It, it, in, in the internal space is, is amazing, it's something very local, but it's something that uh, that is, you know, well defined. Uh, any questions so far about what the duality is or t duality? <laughs> okay. So the way I've been drawing this circle, right? I, 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 so the the the, the Klein circle that I that I have here is sitting at every point in the compactification space, and I drew it along a line. So let's draw. Let's say that this is one of the non-compact coordinates. The non-compact coordinates go from x zero to x eight. So let's say this is direction x8. So I'm just drawing one of the non-compact directions. And I'm just, the process that I was describing here, right? This process, oh, come on. This process, so this process, this process here, is just shrinking the circle homogeneously in the x8 direction. I'm just shrinking it everywhere. But, you know, if I am able to do these things, certainly I should be able to do something like this. What if I consider a geometry like this? So we're, we, we start with, let's say, type 2A and a circle of radius R, and then the circle does, oops, the circle does like that, and at some point it shrinks to be a very, very small circle of radius, from a circle of radius R to a circle of radius alpha prime over R. What is this kind of thing? Well, you can divide space-time in this space in basically three regions. The region where the radius is large, which is this one, the region where the radius is small, and some transition region where it changes. 
Okay. Now this thing on the left, okay, it's basically type two a string theory on circle of radius r, and this thing on the right, because of the duality, is basically type two b on a circle of radius r as well. And this thing in between, it's a mess. It's something which is not described in a simple way in either type two a or type two b, but it's certainly some sort of transition region that allows you to interpolate between type 2a and type 2b. It's very non-geometric, okay? Because remember, when you go from this side to the other, we are doing a T-dual transformation. But there's, an, there's, there's some in-between region that allows you to connect these very two different quantum theories of gravity. And it allows you to connect in a very physical way. You can take a particle here and send it through here. So you can send information and you can send energy throughout. Now, this mess, this, this thing in between, this, this region, a region like this with these properties that allows you to send information and send energy, is what I was calling yesterday a domain wall between two quantum gravities. So what we've done here is we constructed explicitly in string theory, a domain wall between type 2A on a circle and type 2B on a circle, okay? And the, the, this is called domain wall comes from a, from a similar physical situation where you have domain walls like this, which is when you have a magnet, okay? When you have a ferromagnetic material, you typically have what we call domains. So there's regions where you know, all the spins of the iron atoms align one way and the surrounding region, they're aligned in a different way. And these two states, the in and out are different states of the system, different vacuum states. But, um, but, uh, um, but the, 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 the interface that separates them is a domain wall because each of these regions is called a ferromagnetic uh, domain, okay? So that's what a domain wall is. It's basically the same idea as in ferromagnets. When you have a domain wall between, just like the fact that spins up and spins down are two different states of the same theory, the theory of the ferromagnet, whenever you're able to exhibit two quantum gravity vacua as connected by a domain wall, you basically have shown there are two states in the same quantum theory of gravity, okay? So the idea is that the idea of the cobordism conjecture is that this idea of domain walls is really pervasive. But before I go on to, to explain that, is, is the idea of domain wall clear? Is it good? So uh, under which conditions you can connect two theories via domain wall? Excellent, excellent. That's exactly the question that the cobordism conjecture addresses. Here I just gave you a construction, right? Let me give you a situation for which we do not know a construction of such a domain wall, okay? If it, I, I was putting type 2A and type 2B on a circle, if I take type 2A on 10 dimensions and type 2B on 10 dimensions, not on a circle, the, the, this domain wall that I described doesn't really decompactify well, so it doesn't uplift to an object when you send the radius to infinity. And or for this case, we do not know a string construction of the domain wall, okay? The fact that we don't know a construction doesn't mean there's any, but certainly means that you don't know how to construct it. One thing that we can say for sure is that we can define an equivalence relationship between quantum gravities. Quantum gravity one is equivalent to quantum gravity two if they are connected by the main wall. And perhaps you see where this is going. This is there's a finite tension domain wall, which allows you to transmit information and energy. If you can do this, okay, then it's the two quantum gravities are equivalent, and the set of all possible modulo model of this equivalent relation defines actually a cobordism theory, okay? And this cobordism theory, this cobordism group, we call omega quantum gravity, okay? The statement that I was describing yesterday, motivating from global symmetry and whatever, is the cobordism conjecture, is the idea that this group, so, so, so far we define the group, and now there's a physical statement that we believe that this group actually vanishes. So the answer to the question you were asking, according to the cobordism conjecture, is that you can always connect any two quantum gravities by the main, by the main group. Okay, so that is the conjecture. And as Irene was saying yesterday, in particular, this would imply it's true because you can connect anything since we can connect anything 
to, let's say, type B string theory in a number of dimensions, that would mean that string theory, if this conjecture is correct, that would mean the string theory is the unique quantum theory of gravity. Okay. Now it's motivated by this global symmetry conjecture and so on and so forth. Um, um, but it's also supported by examples. Okay. So uh, I wanted to give you a couple examples of, uh, of which is what I actually wanted to do near the end of the lecture yesterday. And then one of the very strong, one, one, yes, exactly. Uh, this notion that all, uh, <laughs> all quantum gravities are connected via uh, domain walls, does it also extend for quantum gravities in different dimensions? Uh, no, this is, this is within a given dimension. Okay, and, 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 the, and the reason one way to think about it is that when you decompactify, that's like an infinite distance limit. Okay, so it's impossible that the domain wall has the same tension. Okay, but in practice, you know, for, for, for physical purposes, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Uh, because, you know, you could connect, let's say, the standard model to type 2a on a T6 of radius as large as the universe. So that would be more like connected to 10 dimensions. If the tension would be large, but yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Miguel, is yeah. our domain walls functorial? So if, if I take, for example, the topological, a topological twist of, of type 2A or type 2B, does the domain wall produce something on the, on the topological field theories associated with them? So, so let, let me see. I'm not sure I understand the question. You're taking a topological twist of type 2A, type 2B. So the, the, the topological twist of type 2A or type 2B is written from the, it's not really a quantum gravity, right? It's something we use to compute some amplitudes and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah but uh, it, it follows from quantum gravity, right? It's a, it's a, it's a truncation of, of this theory, right? And this is what I'm asking. <laughs> that they survive the, the topological twists. Yeah, this, but the, this I don't know. This, this honestly, I don't know because I, I don't know enough of topological twists to, to answer this question. So the, the way I think about it is a, it's, it's, it's just a trick you can use in the worksheet to compute certain string amplitudes. I don't know how that affects the full quantum gravity. There's more to quantum gravity than the worksheet and so on and so forth. Okay. This is actually something I'd like to understand better. What is the physical meaning of topological twist? Until I understand that, I cannot answer it, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, can Any more questions? Well, uh, can, can this domain well solution be thought of as some differential in a mass complex? So, uh, sorry, can, can they what? Uh, can these domain wall solutions be thought of as a differential in some Morse complex? As a differential in some Morse complex, let's, uh, I don't know. I really, no. <laughs> I, so maybe, maybe I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't have the mathematical background to answer that. Like if you explain a bit more, I can try to connect yeah. or if someone else in the audience uh, knows, no, no, knows more, please uh, free, free, free welcome to, to, to answer, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, if, if I was in person there, I will ask you about this during coffee. Uh, but yeah. Okay, sorry another about question. that. Sorry, another yeah? question. So I get confused with, about this uh, thing of string theory being the unique uh, theory of quantum gravity. I mean, imagine that you, know, like you study all the string theory compactifications and so on, and everything is okay with this conjecture. And then someone tells you, oh, look, there is this other thing which is totally different, which is a theory of quantum gravity that we don't care about, but you know, it's just consistent mathematically. What would be the concept charged? I mean, wh why is that wrong? Well, it, it, it's kind of like, <coughs> so when Yana was talking about higher form symmetries, right? She was talking about charges that can be carried by particles. Charges can be carried by strings. Charges can be carried by membranes. If you keep following that logic, you end up what you might call a top form global symmetry, which is a charge that is carried by the whole space. If the space itself cannot disappear to nothing, it doesn't emit a bubble of nothing, really. It's not really, uh, it, it, it's kind of like saying carries a conserved charge. I mean, the, the vacuum itself is the conserved charge. Uh, you cannot destroy it, right? So in particular, this thing means that every vacuum every quantum gravity vacuum has a domain wall to the trivial quantum gravity, which is a theory, which in particular doesn't even have a metric. It's, a, it's like a face of gravity where the graviton is back, sorry, is gapped. So this is a theory of, of all of nothing. Now to answer your question more precisely, which is along the lines, okay, fine. So suppose someone gives you something which is completely disconnected with string theory. How would I understand it? How, how would I, who, how would I even attempt to check the covariance and conjecture? Well, 
In general, I wouldn't know the answer, but suppose we are a bit lucky and the theory that has been given to you, it's a, it's a quantum theory of gravity, independent of string theory, it's a quantum theory of gravity in ADS, in anti de Sitter space, okay? So if it's in anti de Sitter space, then by the ADS CFT correspondence, you're telling me that you actually have a large CFT. And then I can follow a construction, very nice construction by, in a paper by Oguri and Takayanagi, which basically draw a picture like this. If you have quantum gravity one and quantum gravity two, and there's a domain wall between them in the bulk, okay? What that matches is there's a, some sort of domain wall between the CFT one and CFT two. Okay, so this thing here is a domain wall between CFT two. And they show that not only has to be a domain wall, it has to be a particular kind of domain wall that preserves a subgroup of the conformal group, and it's called a conformal interface. So the question, the covertism conjecture in ADS CFT really maps to the question. So in ADS CFT, maps to the question, is there a conformal interface between any two holographic CFTs? Okay. And now you see, we've translated the question to a language in which we could in principle try to answer it. So I will have to look at the CFT dual to your quantum gravity and see if we can try, maybe we put it in a lattice, try to RG flow on both sides to, you know, this is, this, is, this, is, this is something that is certainly possible. So people, for instance, Mike Douglas has this conjecture that the space of all quantum field theories are connected by RG flows, okay? And if that is true, then something like this would follow holographically, okay? So in ADS CFT, you're actually, if you could establish this thing, you would be essentially be proving that string theory is the unique quantum theory of gravity in ADS at least. And then you could prove it kind of rigorously. Okay, for more general theories, I don't know. Did I answer the question? Yes, thanks. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, all right, so. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to give you now a, a list of a few examples uh, of defects predicted by the covertism conjecture, but um, perhaps for the, for the sake of time, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that very, very quickly. In, if, if, some, in some, if somebody's uh, interested in, 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 each of the, in each of the, in each of the objects, then, then you can ask, but let me just then briefly copy for you the table of spin partition groups for uh, so, so what we're going to be studying now is, uh, is this what is the application of correlation conjecture to type to a string theory? What are the objects that we predict? Okay, so we have coordination groups. This, I'm just going to look at the spin coordination groups. I could look also at things in Boulder and Mormon fields and so on and so forth. I could keep going down the table, but just to, to show you what the defects are. So this is a very nice case because all the defects here are actually known brains and string theory. So, you know, it checks out, it, 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 it is correct, okay? So, uh, sorry, let me, uh, so okay, Z plus Z. And then, well, um, there, there's a bunch of generators that I won't bother to, to, to worry. And let me tell you what happens to each of these symmetries. So this one, is broken by 08 minus plane plus ABA brains. So this is the object predicted by the conjecture. Is there anything theory? This one is predicted by the same object. It's also broken by the same object on a circle. Uh, broken by same object on torus. This is broken. This, this one we talked about yesterday. This is broken by. Uh, uh, and uh, something like an M, like a, like a, a background like this. So, for instance, imagine I go to the orbifold limit of K three. These backgrounds exist in string theory. These are orbifolds; they're completely fine. They completely break this thing. So these guys are zero. There's no broken. And for these two classes, they are generated by two different manifolds. Oops. Oh, they are generated by. Um, uh, let's see. What is this? Okay. They are they are broken by a spin seven manifold. So they're generated by spin seven manifold and by the quaternionic projective plane. And this one is broken as well by what we call O0 planes. And this one is actually gauge because there's a term 
in, um, in, in M theory that couples enter brain charge to a curvature class which, uh, which is non zero for, for HP. Okay? So if you apply cobalt descent conjecture to, to, to tag two wave descent groups like this, you discover a lot of classes that were already known by string theory conservations. And in fact, there is always a pattern. If the class you're looking for is SUSY, you know, it can be the, the defect can, if, if the defect that, that kills the class or the defect that is predicted by coalition conjecture is supersymmetric, then we already knew about it because we really have a very good handle of supersymmetric defects. The coalition conjecture predicts new objects for non susy case. Okay. So, for instance, like the domain wall between type 2A and type 2B in type. Okay. So this is just to show you that the cobordism, the the, the, the cobordism conjecture really, you know, it, it matches what we know from, from, from string theory. And now I'm gonna give you quickly. So the plan for the rest of the, for the rest of the days, I'm gonna give you one quick, very recent application of cobordism conjecture where we actually used it to learn something about quantum gravity from Swampland. We find that precise constraint on allowed geometries and the and the constraint that we find exactly matches what we found from string theory. And the swamp argument has nothing to do with string theory. Okay. Um, and then after that, I'll, 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 I'll give one last example of a calculation of a cobordism, uh, of a cobordism group, much like the one Arun gave, using the Adam spectral sequence instead of the Atia Hilfiger spectral sequence. The Adam spectral sequence is more complicated, but also more powerful. Before I go on, any questions about this? Uh, yes. Uh, so, do these uh, type two A defects match by T duality the ones of the type two B duality? Uh, you know, as a GL plus to, to Z bordisms? Um, let's see. Uh, they 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 have to. Once you take into account the the, the thing, they, they 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 have to match. Yes. Uh, but I haven't exp I haven't I haven't checked this explicitly uh, because we we still haven't. Uh, okay, so what, what can happen often is that the, the covertism groups here, let me, let me write that down because it's probably an important lesson. Como, like the covertism groups with structure, like, you know, spin for type 2A or something like that, are in general not invariant on their duality. Why is that? Well, covertism groups are, if you have some compactification which is geometric, what are the non-geometric defects? The conversion is about what are non-geometric defects you need to introduce to kill these classes. But duality messes this up. It could be that this whole configuration with a singular defect becomes something very, very smooth after duality, which would mean that, you know, the, the, uh, the, in this dual description, there is no, there is no, um, there's no addition. There's there's there, there's no additional defect to add. This is just part of what is captured by the supergravity cobordism. Okay, so duality can mix these two things, and this is why the cobordism group don't have to match on the duality in general. Did I answer your question, Ivan? But yeah, I mean, uh, I wonder just if the defects can match, you know, appropriately. Not that the the big groups match one by one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. If you have some object that kills some class, there has to be something else. It's just that something else could be smooth. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. So you yeah. Oh, sorry. You were saying. No, no. I, I was just giving an example. Yeah, but I think it is clear. But please go ahead. Yeah. So before you said that in this domain was there is nothing geometric. You said that there is a mess and we don't know what it is. And now you are saying that they are caused by these defects. So can you say something about what is the relationship between these defects and, and the domain walls? And what do we expect about or what are the properties of this? Uh, Domain was, I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what type of uh, right. relationship so, between theories. Between what? Between between theories? Yeah, yeah between the two quantum gravity theories. If I think they as a sort of functor, I don't know what, what, what I'm expecting from this. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly where you're asking, like, uh, uh, but, but by it being a, if you can explain perhaps a bit more, what do you mean by them being a functor? Like, the, the only thing that I, I'm really trying to give a physical definition here, which I think is good, which is, 
there's just some wall like this one, which allows you to send information. And then, you know, it is not guaranteed at all that, you know, in quantum gravity, it, everything has to be described by geometry. When, you know, the string scale is very low or where the coupling is very strong, the notion of geometry starts losing meaning. And it's very difficult for me to be precise about what this domain wall does. But, I can be more the, precise in some cases. The defects yeah? the you have written now are geometric, right? No, 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 sorry, my bad. No, so these defects, okay, could be, for instance, uh, they, they could be, so, so yeah, sure, this part of it is geometric, but the object here, you know, could be could be some brain, could be some object which is strongly coupled, could be, you know, there, there's there's no, okay, so for instance, when I'm writing the cover distance between, if so, I'm gonna consider, you know, like this, this was like the cover distance to nothing, but if I wanna do the cover distance between, you know, two domain walls, maybe something like this, and there's some object which is localized, but extends like this to, and it, it's a mess, it could be a mess. What is the relationship between the third column, the objects in the third column in your table, and the domain walls? That's my question. Yes, very good. So what I was writing here, sorry, maybe, I, maybe sorry, I didn't explain that clearly. What I was writing here with the defects, I was actually writing the object that allows, if you compactify type two a string theory in each in, in generators of these borders and groups, okay? What is the geometry or the object that, that allows you to, to write the domain wall between the type two a string theory compactified on that thing, which is two a on whatever, and nothing. Okay, so for instance, yes, in this case, for instance, this is a geometry. You're completely right. It's what I was describing yesterday. In this case, it's a geometry. Yeah, sure. Sometimes it can be a geometric over this. But in this other case, in this other case, it's an orientifold plane. It's something extremely singular. This is really just saying, well, you have type 2A. Here's type 2A vacuum. And then it ends on an 08 minus plane plus 8D8 brains. And here's nothing. How do you describe that geometrically? You can't. It's just and a solution we know that's there in string theory and we know it ends, okay? And we know, and this is in a particular case, in this particular case, it's a solution that people had studied before from the point of view of string theory. But there's no picture of a manifold shrinking or something. That picture is not needed. It's often there, but not always. And it's not needed for these ideas to make sense. But Does that make sense? Yeah, but still, I don't understand. So are the objects in the third column create, creating domain walls or? Yes, is that it? Yeah, they are creating a domain wall to nothing in this case, to nothing. Okay. These are so, the geometries or defects that you need to have the domain wall to nothing. So okay. These are the domain wall. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So in the in the picture where you have the and so here I'm taking the picture. So cover this in conjecture, right? It's telling you there's always a domain wall to nothing. So I'm exhibiting it for you here. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Mm hmm Okay, very good. So let me then give you quickly this um, this application of uh, of cover this in conjecture, um, which is in the context of understanding quantum gravities, classifying the landscape of quantum gravities with 16 supercharges, so with n equals one minimal supersymmetry in eight dimensions and nine dimensions. Okay, so we're gonna ask ourselves what is what are the what is the most general possible quantum theory of gravity in, with n equals one in eight dimensions and nine dimensions, and see what we can learn about that from covariance and conjecture. Well, with this much supersymmetry, life is actually very simple. There are just two multiplets. There is a gravity multiplet. Okay, and then there is a vector multiple. As you can imagine, the vector multiple contains gauge fields, contains U1 gauge fields. There's there's a, there's a, in a there's there's a, there's a modulized space, and here at point of modulized space, the gauge field is U1. And so you 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 know when you're writing a low energy supergravity Lagrangian, if you want to construct supergravity, if you want to construct a supergravity, you need to have one of these exactly one gravity multiple for theory of gravity. And if you wanna have, and, and the most other you know, thing is you can have some number, let's say R of this. 
Okay, so this number R of vector multiplets is called the rank of the theory. And at the generic point in, in modelized space, there's a modelized space coming from scalars and gravity multiplet and vector multiplet. But at the general point of modelized space, the Lagrangian of the theory, everything at low energies, everything is fully determined by SUSY, by supersymmetry, and by just this number R. The only thing you're free to choose is the number of vector multiplets. Okay? So this is because of supersymmetry. Everything is very constrained. So this actually makes for a nice question of what is the swamp, uh, sorry, the landscape and so on. So we just raised the possible, what is the possible landscape of theories with 8D and 9D and equals one. It's very simple to draw. We just, I'm gonna put some code here for dimension, eight, nine. Actually, I'm going to go all the way to seven. And then, you know, I just need to tabulate all possible values of the rank. Okay. So, rank can be, you know, uh, so for instance, for, oh, sorry, why I did it backwards. Okay. So, you could have a theory in dimensions with rank zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 17. There's some swampling argument that I will not describe here as relative distance conjecture that suggests that you should not go beyond 17. Okay. <laughs> this is not necessary for what I'm describing now, but it allows me to write a final landscape. So, so that's nice. Uh, oops. And the same thing goes in eight dimensions, right? So I can also draw zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 18, because this wasn't 18, and in seven dimensions until. 17, so 7, 19, 11, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. So, in principle, it looks like you could have, you know, any value of the rank for any number of dimensions, right? If you just take any value of R, you write down a Lagrangian, and it seems a completely fine supergravity Lagrangian. There's nothing wrong with it. However, we actually know a little bit more. We know since the 90s that the things that I'm coloring now in red, okay, like this, uh, you know, even ranks in dimension nine and all the ranks in dimension two have a global gravitational anomaly. There's some sort of anomaly of the kind that I described yesterday. And so we know those guys are inconsistent. This has been known since the 80s. But that's about the only restriction that we have, okay? Well, uh, let's see if Swampland uh, can tell us anything more, okay? And I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a bit uh, a bit quick about the about the about the argument. Uh, you can ask me more about it about the technical details of it. I just want to give you the basic uh, the basic structure of the argument. So the argument starts with the observation that because of the supersymmetry algebra, one is actually forced. If you look at the Lagrangian and, and, the, and, and the supersymmetry algebra, 9D, 8D, and 7D theories with n equals one have a parity symmetry. And it's a parity symmetry that squares, not doesn't square, when you act with two reflections, right? You go back to where you were. But when you act with them on a fermion, you can pick an extra minus sign. So this is a parity symmetry that when square acts as minus one on fermions. So this is what we call a pin minus symmetry. So that means that these supergravities admit a pin minus structure. And we are going to assume that this is a good symmetry of, of the theory. And that means that type two, that these supergravities admit a pin minus structure. And of course, that means in the same way that before in type 2A, I was doing spin bordism groups, I get to do what we call pin minus bordism groups, because this is bordism groups of things with a pin minus symmetry. And in particular, the second 
pin minus rotation group is Z8. The generator is RP2. Okay. Ooh. And, you know, according to cover descent conjecture, there has to be an object, a defect, such that RP2 becomes a boundary. What is that thing? Well, it's very simple. Just write a normal similarity like this, then this will have RP2 as boundary. So cover this in conjecture tells you, you can uh, compactify the theory on, uh, so th th it's telling you, it's a new information that is coming purely from Swampla, that this singularity, I'm gonna put it, this singularity is okay. It's a valid compactification background, okay? That's what Cobordism is buying you here. Any questions so far? Okay, good, because we're getting to the punchline. If you have the singularity, well, then you can certainly glue a bunch of them together, right? Sure, but first you'll have to unlock your device. Okay, Google. Just like yesterday wants to participate. <laughs> so you, 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 can, you, you, can, you, can, you can glue together a bunch of the singularities. And in particular, what that means is that you're allowed to compact it to, to, this is an allowed background of the theory. You can, you, you, you can have a compact background, which is like just gluing eight of the singularities and it's a T3 mod Z2 background. And now, you know, I am allowed to compactify let's say the 90 theory on this thing, okay? When I do that, I get a six dimensional theory and guess what? It turns out that once you work out all the details, which of course I'm not gonna give you, but once you do it, this 60 theory has an anomaly, okay? This theory has a gravitation, what we call a gravitational anomaly, and therefore it's potentially inconsistent. The anomaly that you get, so this is a gravitational anomaly, so that means it's an anomaly we want to cancel in a quantum theory of gravity, because anomalies involving gravity in a quantum theory of gravity are not okay. So this anomaly actually depends on the rank of the theory, okay? It makes sense, right? It, the, the, um, the, the, when, you com when you do a compactification, you do dimensional reduction on this thing, you need to reduce all 10 D fields on, on, the, on this background. And they're gonna give you a number, uh, a, number of, uh, a number of zero modes. And if you have R vector fields, you're gonna get R zero modes. Is there a and twisted they are, sector? Sorry? They're a twisted sector from the- they are, they're, 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 they're very, good, very good, Timo. So this is one of the details I didn't want to get into because of lack of time. There are indeed twisted sectors. Uh, so what actually you get here is a six dimensional one comma zero theory. So there's the usual, gravitational anomaly cancellation condition. And in this, when, when you introduce the number of tensor vectors and hypers, you need to take into account contributions coming from the twisted sectors, which you do not control because coordination theory doesn't tell you what they are. However, this geometry has eight fixed points and they're all identical. So you know, whatever contribution you have is a multiple of eight, okay? And it's precisely because of this unknown that uh, uh, the, 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 the anomaly cancellation condition uh, um, for, for 6D supergravities, which is a cancellation condition over the integers, actually becomes uh, a condition modulo eight. So imposing that the anomaly vanishes amounts to the condition that the rank is congruent to one modulo eight in nine dimensions. And once you run the argument in eight dimensions, which you can also do is you get that the rank is two modulo eight. So these anomalies only cancel in these cases. Did I answer your question, Timo? Perfect. Yes, thank okay. you. All right. So once you work out the anomaly cancellation condition, you get this thing. And this is coming from covert descent conjecture. And when I go back to this table and ask what is the meaning of this? Well, I'm just gonna color in red all the theories that are not allowed by this. So it's basically, uh, this, this, and here is, this is out, this is out, this is out, this is out, right? Okay, very good. So that's the only, there's a few things which are left, okay? And now I'm gonna color in green the compactifications, the non 
theories of gravity that we can get from compactifying string theory on different animals to nine and eight dimensions, okay? We don't know that many backgrounds. In fact, we only know backgrounds with rank one, with rank nine, and with rank 17. So all of this is red too. All the numbers between are red and here too. And in eight dimensions, we only know compactifications with rank two, rank 10, rank 18. So from swampland principles, from this simple swampland principle, we derive a constraint on the rank, which is a precise modulo eight constraint, a, mo a, a modulo eight periodicity of the rank, so to say. And this is exactly matched by non-string construction, okay? Now, we are really talking about string compactifications in one dimension or two dimensional manifolds. We really believe we know all of them. We believe there's nothing else. So what we are having here is really a realization of an idea you might call string universality. With eight and nine, the supersymmetries, all the known compactifications of string theory really exhaust what swampland constraints make possible. So this is really, in a sense, in eight and nine dimensions, with some caveats uh, related to what happens at special points in moduli space, but the generic point in moduli space, this is really the full answer. This is the end of the swampland game in end and night dimensions. You explain all possible low energy effective field theories, and you exactly explain at, at some point you get a precise match with string theory. Okay, so that's what happens in end and night dimensions. In seven dimensions, we actually also uh, get a um, get a constraint. Uh, we also get a constraint that the numbers here are, you know, the odd numbers are, sorry, the even numbers are again that. And in string theory, we have uh, a bunch of theories, we have theories with rank one, three, five, seven, but we don't have rank nine, we have rank 11, we have rank 19, and there's also nothing here. So in seven dimensions, we haven't succeeded because there's, for instance, this guy. Uh, and some of the guys here actually that that we do not uh, that we do not have to explain that they're in the landscape the swamp. So in seven dimensions, we still haven't done it. But in eight and nine dimensions, the answer is completely. I think I think is completely matched by swampland principles. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So you start with a ninety theory that has no gravitational anomaly. And only after compactifying, you find that the 6D theory has an anomaly. Is yes. it a, in the sense that compactification of a perfectly nice theory is supposed to give you a perfectly nice theory? So, so, so Jose is, 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 is getting at, a, at, at an essential point, which is what I was going to dis discuss next. So let me, let me defer that question and, and ask for any other questions, because this is what, I was what I'm going to describe. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the 89 history. Are, can you have a non-abelian gauge algebra, or is it only just a bunch of ones? Very good, very good. So what happens is, so this is, I, I was being a bit quick here because of time. So when you write out the multiplets here, okay, you have the vector multiplets have a gauge field and a scalar. Now they're in the same representation, of course, because they're part of the same multiplets. So they're both in the adjoint, okay? And that means that, uh, you know, if I give a generic vector to the scalars, I'm gonna break to the cartan, which is U1 to the whatever. So that's why I mean by a generic point in modulized space. At special points in modulized space, you can have non-abelian gauge fields, okay? So that's another part of the story that I'm not describing here. Using coverage and conjecture, you can also give constraints on the possible global forms of the non-abelian gauge group you have there. And in this particular case, actually, it's very interesting. The swampland prediction came out before the string theory calculation. So for instance, we made some predictions for the for the global forms of the gauge group that you get here, which corresponds in string construction to what is called the CHL string. We predicted that for instance, SPK uh, mod Z2 should not be there when K is one, two or four. And then only later people actually check this in string theory, this had not been computed and what they found exactly matches uh, the predictions that we have. So it's an example where the swampland actually made a prediction for string theory, not the other way around. Any more questions? Is there a reason why you look at omega two and, and then omega three or for some other dimension? <laughs> no, I, I just look at omega two because it gives me nice constraints. Of course, we actually looked at all of them. Uh, and this, you know, th th this is, I'm giving you the odd case where you get very strong results from cover design conjecture. Usually you do not get these strong results. Uh, and, yeah. You should repeat the same algorithm for all the other group in principle, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. So I, I didn't understand what, uh, 
So even for d equals nine, you should look at all covariance groups. Yeah, you should call it omega three, omega four, omega five, omega six, omega seven, omega eight, up to omega nine. But and why not more? Well, because it's the covariance groups. Remember, a p then a p covariance group gives you a d minus p minus one form global symmetry. So if p is too large, it doesn't make sense really. Like it's looking, you know, if you have a d-dimensional theory, you cannot compactify it. If you have a 10 dimensional theory, you cannot compactify on a 25 dimensional background. So you don't look at omega 25. Right, but could I have a theory of quantum gravity that lives in 30 dimensions? And, and, and then you would look up to omega 30. But that's what I mean. Uh, so you cannot change, I mean, if I told you this theory exists, how would you rule out that? Uh, I mean, how would you connect it to a string theory? If you gave me something like this, well, I, I, I certainly couldn't connect it to any 30 dimensional string theory. What I would try to do is I would compactify it on some manifold, you know, uh, down to 10 dimensions or less. And then that's what I would try to connect to string theory. Okay. All good? Okay. So let, let me briefly, because I'm really, it's, yeah, I'm really going to be, over time, um, so there's um, there's so th there's the, the, the question that Jose asks is really the key question. Usually, when you have an anomaly on field theory, or and you compactify, I mean, this is just a different background of the theory. How can you get an anomaly? Well, this is really what the cover distance conjecture is telling you. This is true if you compactify on a smooth manifold. But we are not compactifying on a smooth manifold. We're compactifying on T3 mod Z2. Just to connect to the language that I was using yesterday, I told you that you have a theory in D dimensions. There is a D plus one dimensional anomaly theory, which controls the anomaly. So for instance, for a nine dimensional theory of gravity, I have A10. It's a topological theory that controls the anomaly, whatever it is. In principle, to compute all the analysis I was describing yesterday, I evaluate this theory in any 10 manifold. And when I look at this, it's zero. But I actually, the physical thing to do is to evaluate it in any possible allowed background of the theory. And I just use Cobordism conjecture to argue that a background of this form is also allowed. Now, this answers your question, Jose, because if you look at it like that, if you look at anomalies in this background, these are anomalies in 10 dimensions. And what I'm telling you is that these anomalies do not vanish unless the rank is one model of it. Okay? So what the covertism conjecture is doing here for you is a very strong interplay between covertism and anomalies. Covertism is enlarged conjecture is enlarging the allowed class of backgrounds where you're supposed to be able to compute anomalies. And then we are, um, and then we are uh, uh, using the anomaly cal calculation to, to show that there's an inconsistency, okay? So this in the end, covertism is giving you more anomalies and anomalies are very powerful, very constrained. Does that answer your question, Jose? This is a point I wanted to make. I don't think we, we phrased it like this in any paper, but this is really what is happening. And of course, this is exciting because once you start doing this, you can start asking questions like this for the standard model, for instance. Can I compactify the standard model on, on a, let's say on a, you know, a K3 with frozen singularities in some sense? Stuff like that. Can I get new anomalies from that? Can I get constraints on the standard model? These are all things that we're thinking of, uh, we think we're thinking about. Uh, I think it's very, very exciting. And I really want to get you excited about this thing. Combining covertism with anomalies is very powerful and very unexplored. It's a nice thing to look at, I think. Um, um, any questions? <laughs> so, so basically, this is a die-free anomaly that we discussed yesterday. This is this is like a die-free anomaly, but I am not. So, die-free anomalies were also in smooth manifolds. What I discussed yesterday is always on smooth manifolds. This is even beyond that. This thing is not smooth and it's not smoothable. Okay. Okay. So it's beyond that. It's only because of covertism that I know I can look at this anomaly. Okay, uh, normally if someone tells you, oh, look, your anomaly theory evaluated on this singular 10 manifold doesn't vanish, then I can, usually I would just shrug and say, well, maybe my theory doesn't have to make sense on that manifold. 
It's only because of coverage that we argue it has to make sense on this manifold that we get a constraint, okay? So that's 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 the teeth of coverage and conjecture. It's really very strongly ruling out quantum gravity, possible quantum gravity. Okay. So um, I think uh, we're gonna be uh, a, a bit over time, uh, and want to check with the chair if this is gonna be okay. We can have five, ten more minutes. Yeah, I think it's fine. We finish example, right? Five, ten minutes. Yeah, we wanna do one. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, on top of the time, that's so why it's total that 15. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to be very efficient on this. So we just wanted to give you one last example of computation, because there's also people, computations too, of how do you compute this cover distribution? So this is all very nice, very interesting. How do you actually use it in practice? Well, Arun gave an example. So, uh, Arun gave an example of the Atia Hirthebrook spectral sequence. Uh, how do you see the Atia Hirthebrook spectral sequence? And this is the, this is the, the, the easier uh, calculation. Uh, now we're going to give another example, which you could also study with Atia Hirthebrook, but just to show how the formulation works, we're going to use it with the more powerful Adams spectral sequence. <laughs> Now this is this is this is uh, this is a, a more powerful comp uh, computational technique uh, that works in more general cases. So, for instance, Arun and I had this paper where we use cover distance groups actually to discover a new anomaly and a new topological term in type two B string theory. And to compute these cover distance groups, one had to use the Allen spectral sequence. So the cover the cover distance group that I'm going to be computing it's one which is relevant physically, which is I'm going to compute we're going to compute omega five spin Z8. Why is spin Z8? Well, it's kind of like spin C. What I mean is that these are manifolds uh, uh, where, you know, the, this is five dimensional manifolds where the fermions transforms, there, there's fermions, they transform a sections of the, uh, of the spin bundle times Z8. And the C2 subgroup of this Z8 is identified with the C2 subgroup of, with the fermion number here. So this is the structural root that fermions transform. This is similar to spin C, which is spin times U1 over Z2. This is spin C. We just change U1 by, by Z8. And the reason this is important, this is, for instance, it, it, it appears, appears in a decomposition, in a simplification of, of cover design groups of type 2B, uh, including duality the duality symmetry. Okay, so it's an important thing. And you can find this in our paper uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Arun, Jonathan, and Marcus, but it's also in papers by Tachikawa, Shie, Yonekura, where they explain it very clearly. Okay, but for, for now, this, this part of it is just about the calculations. So how do we compute this thing? Okay, very good. I'm going to tell you exactly how I resolve uh, uh, an Adam's spectral sequence problem. Okay. And it basically have uh, two steps. Step number one, write down the cover this group one wants to compute. Okay. With the spectral sequence. Step number two, realize you actually don't know Adam's spectral sequence. So you call a room for help. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna do just that. Arun, can you please help? <laughs> there we go. And this is how you do it. It's really easy. <laughs> yeah, so I guess. <laughs> he's, he's really amazing. He, he's, he's really incredible uh, with these calculations. So I don't know. Everyone's always very nice about this. And it's, you know, the out of spectral sequence, it has this reputation in mathematics and also increasingly in physics. And like, What's really nice is the cases that people care about, just like just spin Z8, there's, I don't know, it's sort of just hard enough that like, okay, you know, there's like, it's an interesting puzzle, and but it's also attractive. Like I was able to learn, like I was able to learn this stuff, even though I'm not one of the crazy computational homotopy people. So if you remember when I talked about this stuff at the beginning of the week, there was this sort of step-by-step -step process. So one is identi identify exactly the, sy the symmetry there. So there was sort of like, what question are you actually trying to solve?
So fortunately, Miguel has already done this for me because that's the part that I'm not as good at. Then you want to express this as spin, you know, some spinboardism of something. So as much, you know, explaining exactly, so there's going to be several steps and I'm going to go through them very quickly. So I can't, I don't have the time to explain exactly how you do this, but the idea is just in words, I'll say very quickly, a spin Z8 structure can be recast as something called a twisted spin structure. So a spin C structure is a, it's a, on, on a vector bundle is you direct someone on a line bundle and ask for a spin structure on that. And so you can recast a spin Z8 structure in a similar way. And once you do that, that you know, a, a general theorem says, oh, I'm looking at the spin boardism. Or I guess it would be spin five boredism. Um, so for the people on this side of the, how easy is it to see if you're all the way over? Okay, it looks like you can still see it for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you find there, there's some Tom space and you, and you compute the spin boards with that Tom space. So, you know, I, I, though I don't have time to say exactly why right now. I'd love to, if, if any of you want to know more about this later, I'd be happy to talk. But this is bias in general. Um, and when I say bias in general theorem, I'm not saying, oh, let me dismiss this. I'm saying that it's the kind of thing you can read and then apply yourself rather than having to do it yourself. So now you have to compute the input. So I guess step one is you want it is for the atom spectral sequence, you need to compute H4, so the cohomology of this Tom space, one, two, with the action of, of two things called square one and square two. So what are these? Things? So the mod two cohomology of this thing is told to you by something called the Tom isomorphism theorem. And, but you also need to know these two co these things called cohomology operations. So these are these are things which act universally on on cohomology groups, not two cohomology groups, and the action is kind of abstract. So this is something which is not always possible to look up, but it, but there's some formulas. And so what I recommend is there's a bunch of great examples of this in this paper of Beaudry and Campbell. It's a unique paper by those two authors. And so they, they spell out a lot of examples of this. They don't do Z mod four, but they do things like O1, O2, O3, SO2, SO3. So what you end up finding, it's, it's conventional to sort of draw this in the picture, is there's a, um, so let's say that this is the degree. One, two, three. Um, more colors. Here's these sort of alternating. Um, I'm going to explain this diagram in just a minute. So the cohomology is is going to be rank one in every degree, and they're 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 connected by these square two. So here's degree zero. Here's degree one. Here's degree two. Here's degree three. So square two connects to zero and two, square one, sorry, square two connects one and three, square two connects four and six, square two connects five and seven. So it, this continues on. And so what, what you do is you look at this and you say, okay, my cohomology, which a priori is a very complicated intuitive thing, it breaks into a large number of small pieces. So that's part one. Um, part two is you compute, X groups of these of each of each module. So let's say I want to compute the X of this. So these four pieces are the same. So I just have to compute the X force. So okay, this sounds hard, right? So let's just look it up. And you look it up in exactly the same place. So this allows you to write down the E2 picture. Um where's a good place to write this? Should I jump over to the other side? 
Well, I mean, uh, it's it's being recorded right to the to the screen. So oh wow, okay, <laughs> that's that's a surprise. Okay, great. Um, let's go. So the atom spectral sequence is displayed a little. Zero, one, two, three, four. Ooh, if I want to do five, I need to make this smaller. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> So if you remember the atia Hertzberg spectral sequence, the total grading was sort of diagonal, right? Like if I wanted to know the degree five, for example, it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five. For the atoms, it's vertical because you, you sort of rearrange it. So this direction is T minus S and this direction is S. So um, if, if X is something you've heard of before, X of an ordinary thing is graded in one direction, which is a homological rating, that's S. We also have this different, another direction, T, which comes from the fact that cohomology is graded. So you look up the x rays and I'm going to draw this picture and then I'm going to say what the heck it means because this probably looks sort of like, you know, you may be reminded of hieroglyphics. So the x groups are, because everything in this takes place over z mod 2, the x groups are a vibrated algebra over z2. So every dot is a z2 and a line. Is an action by something called H0. So what is going on here is that the whole atom spectral sequence. So Miguel mentioned that the atom spectral sequence is more is harder and more powerful than the Hertz. Part of the reason it's harder is because this is very abstract. The reason it's more powerful is that you have this whole structure, the atom spectral sequence of a point, like sort of the simplest possible one, acts on the atom spectral sequence of anything else. And so there's there's an object called H0 in the atom spectral sequence of a point. And it acts in the sense of this is a module over, over that algebra, add a spectral sequence over a point, and it's acting here. So for example, if you start here, H, you, you have this infinite H0 tau, and then you have another one here, and another one here, and another one here, and so on. So this is really helpful because differentials must commute with this action. And so for example, in this very like two-dimensional thing, there's really sort of only one dimension of differentials in front. In fact, there's even more structure, but we'll, um, you know, I, I could talk all day about that and let's not have that. When I say I could talk all day, it's not necessarily there's a lot to talk about. I just think this stuff is very cool. So you'll notice there's another copy of this uh, elbow. I think it's technically called the cofiber of eta, but you know, who's keeping track? So there's another one starting in degree. So, you know, we computed by which I say looked up the X once and now we get to use it four times. So there's another one starting in degree four. And there's another one starting in degree five. Great, okay, so we found the E2 page. And when I say we found the EQ page, really there was a lot of using someone else's theorem, using someone else's theorem, using someone else's theorem. And that's the beauty of this stuff is that like the mathematicians have been doing this for decades and we get to just take advantage of the stuff that they've done for our problems. So now, okay, the differentials go over one. And then up R. Right, so so on the ER page, a differential goes over to the left one, up R units. So I should say left. So there's lots of possible differentials. I mentioned the differentials have to commute with this action, right? But like, so but all that means is that if, if I have a differential here, say, I won't, but we'll see later. I can slide that up. So as soon as I know the differential on one element of the tower, I know it on the entire tower. So this is really nice. You know, we don't really have the structure of the Tia Hertz where we, we may have to like resolve differential more like one at a time. But look, there are so many possible differentials. And once I start getting over here, does the differential be yellow? Is it the blue or the green? So there's lots of differentials, that's sad. So this is actually one of the harder cases. I promise that like oftentimes differentials just go away, but here they don't. So what you do, is you use what's called the main Milgram theorem. 
And so that, so the main Milgram theorem is a general result that says if, if you want to understand a differential between two towers in the atom spectral sequence, you can understand that by computing Bochstein operations in this cohomology ring. So probably better than trying to say that in words would be to say, you know, Jonathan Campbell has a paper from 2017. And somewhere in the back, he actually does an example similar to this one, very similar to this one. And so he, he explains, you know, exactly what this, what, what Bakshi means here and how it gets you the differentials. And so what you discover is that in this case, the only differentials are, are, are um, D2s and they look like this. So blue does not have a differential. This blue kills this orange. This blue does not kill this orange. They alternate. So blue, nothing, blue, orange, blue, nothing, blue, orange, blue, nothing, blue, orange. Um, let's see. C8. In degree three, we need to kill this one. So green, orange. Uh, green, the next one is green, yellow. Um, yes, green, yellow, green, orange, and so on. So again, I'm, I'm not being super clear about, well, what is actually going on here, but Jonathan's, Jonathan Campbell's paper says it better than I could right here right now. And the point, the, the point I'm trying to make is, though this looks scary, these differentials can be looked up. And so the atom spectral sequence is not as bad as it seems. So we care about omega-5. So let's actually like do this. So when we, when we do the differentials, the sources of the differentials and the targets of the differentials go away. So what do we learn? Um, I'm going to have to redraw that, which is fine. So degree four. So this process cleans up a lot of things. And then dimension five. Okay, so let's not worry about seven and above. So first, we have an infinite tower. So these H zeros, it turns out, help us in two different situations. Not only do they tell us some differentials, they tell us about multiplications by two. So in this, there's an infinite set of multiplications by two, so we get Z. In this one, there's three, so we get Z8. So the, the first spin Z8 borders group is Z mod 8. In two, we get zero. In three, we just get the one Z, Z mod two. In four, we get Z again. And now in five, there's something interesting. It looks like, we get Z8 plus Z8, right? But there's this kind of annoying phenomenon. So I want to mention this because when I first learned this and when I read Beaudry and Campbell's paper, they were like, oh yeah, this thing doesn't happen very often. You don't need to worry about it. And I would love to be able to tell you. But in this case, you get what's called a hidden extension. So a priori, you know, there's this extension problem on the e infinity page I mentioned. You have two Z2s. Do you know that it's Z2 plus Z2 or is it Z4? And here, what we know is that we have a five-stage extension of a bunch of Z2s. Whatever we get contains a Z8. It contains, like, it has lots of th these sort of two multiplications by two that are non-zero. But a priori, all we know is we could have Z8 plus Z8, Z16 plus Z4, or Z32 plus Z2. All we know is that there's two generators, and one of them gives you something longer than it, at least eight. Are you just the second page or? Oh, uh, no, sorry, we're on the infinity page. Ah, the, ah, you are already... So the, it turns out the D2, there were D2s, which are told to us by this, but May Milgram also tells us there's no higher number. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. Um, so we look at this and we say, huh, can we try and get this by algebra? And then you try a bunch of things and they don't work. And so this is where I want to hand it back to Miguel, who knows how Eden and Variance go. So if you actually before that, if there are any questions about this, and then Miguel will speak over it. Yes. I have a couple of questions. So Great. the second page is essentially the X of something you're saying, right? Precisely, yes. Then it's the X of the cohomology. The other question is, so this was like Z2 only. Is there any case where you need, I don't know, Z2? The your other primes to start from? Great question. Yes. So there's an atom spectral sequence for each prime. I, I mentioned there's that that spin boardism makes it much easier. That only so that works over um over the prime two only. So it only tells you sort of the 
the two torsion in this. Yeah. Now, because we have a Z8 here, there's no other torsion. But if you if you did like spin Z10 boardism or something, you would want to look at five. And there you use a different trick to simplify that where you can just use a GRX. So two sort of the hardest case. But yeah, there are atom spectral sequences at every time. Great. Uh, uh, could you comment on why the Akia Hilton group uh, spectral sequence isn't powerful enough to handle this case? So honestly, it might be with a little more creativity. It's just that, for example, you saw this. So in the Tia Hertz group, we're going to get some, um, you know, some com some group abelian group of order eight. But here, these two H zeros tell you multiplication by two squared is non-zero, so you automatically know this is zero. There's also the fact that we had this this uh, theorem to clean up all the differentials for us, which is not true for a Tia Hertz. So this extra structure that we got, these H zero actions, and often there's also action by something called H one. This just like really simplifies your problems in a lot of cases. And in this case, it simplified it enough to almost tell us the answer. Great. Uh, were there more questions before I hand it back to Miguel? But we are finishing, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I will we're back. finishing. I'm taking one minute, Fernando. You can, you can uh, I don't believe count. you, but okay. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. About count that. it. You count it. You, you stop me in one minute, okay? I will, so I will do this. I don't know how to okay. do the variance, but Miguel does. So okay. that's why I'm so, that. so <laughs> Give me the go. Give me the go. You'll see. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Arun told you there's there's a, there's a, there's an extension problem. How do you solve those? Well, the idea is to solve those is to find some bordism invariance invariance that can detect the extension. In particular, very simple idea. If you find an eta invariant, which as I described yesterday, is a bordism invariant, which you can compute, and you find in some class, for instance, it gives a number which is one over 32, that tells you that the only possibility is the one with a Z32 plus Z2 you had there. And that's actually the one which is uh, correct. So this is again explained in more detail in this period of Shikawa, Shea, and Jonekura, how you do it. And more generally, the way to the key word to compute eta invariance in some spaces, it's called Donnelly's theorem or Donnelly's formula. It's in a paper from the 70s by Donnelly. And it's also described in our room and in this paper as Ikawa Shejimekura. Okay. It's just some technology you need to use. It's not very difficult, some formulas. So just to wrap up, cobordism, there's it's 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 this uh, this the cobordism theory is this interplay between math and physics. There's a lot of things to do now. It's relevant for condensed matter. It's relevant for anomalies. It's relevant for quantum gravity in this way, and its ramifications are ex are extending all this. It's a very fruitful place for collaborations between mathematicians and physicists. Like this is how Arun and I started working, and we have a bunch of projects now. It's very it's a lot of things to do. It's a really great thing to be working on right now. And it extends even further. So the other topic in this set of lectures was about Jacobi forms, right? And elliptic genus and whatever. There is a conjecture called the Stolth, Stolth Teichner conjecture that relates the string vortices and groups which appear, for instance, in heretic string theory. I haven't talked about this, but they appear. If they are related to uh, the theory of Jacobi forms and via a certain covariance theory, which is called TMF, topological modular forms, so the Jacobi forms. So even the Jacobi, the, the story about Jacobi forms and the elliptic genre in the worship can be regarded in a sense as a covariance theory. So it's a very general tool. There's many things to uncover. I hope you enjoyed the lectures. I hope you found it nice. And I hope to have conveyed a little bit, I hope Arun and I conveyed a little bit of the excitement that we feel about that. And we're very sorry for being over time. Thanks so much for your attention. Okay. Yeah, I think we should stop here and go to the coffee break. Okay. <laughs> Probably you can ask Arun or send an email to Miguel or maybe stay here and talk yeah, to him if you want.